So my first question for you is, what is a typical day uh, like inside the lab, working as a bioinformaticist? Sure. I mean, so my routine typically starts with a few basic tasks just in the morning, right? Things like checking emails, catching up with correspondences, a bunch of my projects involve collaborating with a number of different people, both within my lab and outside my lab across different campuses. For example, we work with a lot of collaborators at Stanford. Recently, we've been collaborating with researchers at Mount Sinai. So just keeping track of everything and making sure everyone's on the same page and also making sure any code running didn't break down overnight. So that's just, that, that's just what I usually do in the morning, just make sure everything is, every, everything's running, nothing unexpected has happened while I was asleep. And you, usually it doesn't, usually it's fine. Uh, as far as the rest of the day goes though, usually it, it, it's really context dependent. So I'm normally juggling a few different projects at a time, so I try to set aside time for each project. And I guess just to talk through how these projects go, it really does depend on where I am at the project at the time. This could involve steps like cleaning the data. So that involves making sure the data is well structured. It makes sense, removing outliers, removing cases that don't make sense. For example, some of my projects deal with pregnancy and we in part of the data cleaning step involves removing for example any pregnancies where it states the patient is male because right that doesn't really track and make it too much sense and usually that's that's a very small number aside from cleaning the data also building the computational pipeline for the analysis or running the analysis building up different statistical or machine learning models analyzing the results and arguably one of the most important steps, just writing up the results. Uh, so that's actually what I'm doing for one of my projects right now is working on writing up a manuscript that involves writing up the results, writing up the methods, writing, just documenting everything in a way that we can share that with the public. And so that other research groups can read it, see what we've done, see how they can build on those results. So that involves writing the manuscript and passing it back between myself, IPI Marina, uh, our other co-authors, and just making sure it can be the best it can possibly be. Uh, could you give us some insight into your most recent re research paper on potential therapeutic methods for preventing preterm birth? We're really interested in that. So that paper was looking at using a computational pipeline that the head of the lab, Dr. Marina Sroda, she actually developed while she was in grad school. So this is a computational pipeline that looks at transcriptomic data, looking at RNA, and using those results from both the disease and drug side to find out, okay, so if a disease causes these types of changes in the RNA, and uh, we know from drug experiments that these subsets of drugs cause the opposite sets of changes, then those drugs could potentially be therapeutic for the disease. So that's where the hypothesis came about. And we have used this approach in a number of different contexts, including irritable bowel syndrome uh, and a variety of different cancers, and of course, preterm birth. So in the case of preterm birth, this was really interesting because this pipeline has been applied primarily to diseases with a strong immune system component before. And it's, it wasn't immediately clear that preterm birth has a strong immune system component. This actually builds upon work that was started by a previous member of the group, Bianca Vora, who published a paper in, I believe it was Frontiers of, forgetting the exact journal name, I apologize, but it was a, a paper where they were looking at the transcriptomics of both normal pregnancies, not normal pregnancy, of pregnancies that were carried to term and pregnancies that delivered prematurely to look into, okay, at the biological level, what are the differences between these two types of pregnancies? And what she found was that there was a large immune system component driving the differences between the two. So we decided to take her efforts, piggyback off of that and see, okay, if we try to predict drugs using our existing pipeline, which we've typically applied to diseases with immune system components before, what drugs will come up and would we be able to validate them 
just for context, in preterm birth right now, there's only one drug that's currently used for the prevention of preterm birth. It's only used in select cases. It's a synthetic form of the hormone progesterone. And based on meta-analyses of preterm birth rates between groups of women either on the drug or without the drug, progesterone only appears to work at best about one third of the time. So we can see that there's, there's a need for more therapeutics, more novel therapeutics in order to help prevent preterm birth, which, affects, which can affect up to 15% of pregnancies. Before we continue, I just wanted to clarify, what is the difference between bioinformatics and computational biology? Because I've often heard it used like interchangeably, so I wanted to find out what the difference was. I'm not entirely sure I have a satisfactory answer for that, but sort of in my head is that computational biology is more about using computational tools to study biology, to study systems, right, to figure out what is going on and being able to apply those types of tools to existing biological problems. Whereas I guess maybe bioinformatics has skews more statistical. So you're coming up with hypotheses, you want to answer these questions, and we're trying to use data in a real way to be able to answer these questions in a data-driven manner. But I don't know, for, for me personally there, I have used those two terms interchangeably and I'm not really sure how to best qualify the differences between the two. Uh, Dr. Lee, what would you say is the most eye-opening experience so far in your career? The most eye-opening experience in my career so far, I'd definitely say the ability to see the potential for real world impact. Uh, So I guess just a little background about myself. I actually received my PhD in experimental physics before transitioning to a postdoc doctoral scholarship in bioinformatics. So before that, I was working in physics. I was working on what I thought were really interesting problems. But whenever the inevitable question would come up, okay, what does your work with low temperature magnets have to do with the real world? Will there ever be any technology developed from it? And my answer would be maybe in 20 to 30 years, if ever, at that point. And that's sort of the nature of fundamental science research. But one of the really exciting things for me working in bioinformatics so far has been the ability to just see very clearly where this could go. So for the preterm birth drug repositioning paper, we identified a number of candidates. We identified progesterone as one of the hits, which was great. We identified and validated another one, lonsoprazole, which is an over-the-counter proton pump inhibitor. Uh, So you can very easily see, right, what the next steps would be there, would be trying to set up a clinical trial, trying to see if lonsoprazole is effective in humans and not just in these murine models. So just being able to see that immediate connection between A and B and B to C, where the research could go next. Bioinformatics is really exciting for that because there's always more questions to ask. And it's always also very easy to come up with these questions and very easy to see and justify just why they're so interesting, why they're so so exciting, why we should be pursuing them. Uh, Would you say there is a connection between the physics that you have studied and bioinformatics that you're choosing to pursue right now because my friend is really into physics and I am really passionate about biology, but she always tells me you're the bio person and there's nothing that she's interested in about in the field of biology and it's just totally separate from what she's passionate about. And I wonder what made you, what links these two fields together or are they linked at all? For me personally, the big thing is my training in physics gave me the tools to be able to ask questions, just being able to ask questions and track down their answers, being able to perform independent research, learning how to how to read journal, ar- journal articles, learning how to find the appropriate resources to help you answer questions that you can't answer yourself. Those, these are all things I learned during my time as a PhD in physics. Uh, One of the big things, I guess, is just being able to take a step back from the problem and see the bigger picture. And also physics is all about problem solving, right? And that's that's a very general term. It's a very general thing, but that's really what physics is all about, is giving you the tools to solve problems. 
and not just necessarily teaching you exactly how to solve one problem and then the next problem. That's very applicable to biology and bioinformatics as a whole. I definitely used to be like your friend, Amy. I didn't really have any sort of passion for biology because I always, the biology courses I'd taken in high school and undergrad, they all felt like rote memorization courses. So you need to memorize the names of all the kingdoms and the phylums and the organs inside the cells. And that seemed a very uninteresting to me because I couldn't see the bigger picture then. But now that I'm working directly on real world problems, I can see, okay, why do I need to know these biology biological terms and processes. Why do I need to understand where RNA fits in genetics, for example? Why did you decide to become a bioinformaticist in the first place? And could you describe kind of your path, like starting from high school to college and just to get where you are today? I mean, so in high school, I definitely knew that I wanted to pursue an advanced degree of some kind. Uh, originally, I was debating between both law school and grad school, but I just found myself drawn very closely to both physics, chemistry, and mathematics more generally, which is why I chose to pursue both physics and applied mathematics as a dual major at UCLA. That naturally led to me wanting to pursue a PhD in physics because I just had really great interactions with my teaching assistants. They seemed to really enjoy the opportunity to both teach undergrads and perform research as part of their PhDs, which I thought seemed like a fantastic deal, especially once I found out that grad students do get paid. They don't get paid a lot, but they do get paid and they don't have to pay tuition, which is one of one of the misunderstandings I'd had originally when I was considering grad school, uh, when I was considering getting a PhD. And then once I was in grad school, I was working in experimental physics, I realized then that I really enjoyed working with the data. I realized analyzing the data, figuring out what was going on. What I wasn't so much a fan of was spending six months trying to figure out why my machine wasn't collecting data at all. So working through all the technical problems, all the experimental problems. I mean, it's a, that's a very, very, very important part of the process. I have a tremendous amount of respect for those who are able to have the patience to work their way through those kinds of roadblocks. But I realized that that's not how I wanted to be spending my time. So I threw myself more into learning more data analysis techniques, learning more programming, more coding. Uh, this was around the time when data science was starting to become a real buzzword. So I started looking into potential applications of data science in other fields which led me to contact with Dr. Rhoda and joining her lab in bioinformatics. Once I learned about all the tremendous work she'd been doing, the wide variety of different projects she's been working on, and how she's been applying both these statistical and uh, computational methods to biology, and how you could really use that as a way to tackle biology. Well, I'm interested in learning about uh, the complex machine that you were talking about. What was it? Uh, I mean, so this was for my physics PhD. Specifically, it was a cryostat, basically a machine that lets you bring temperatures down very low. So, but so we were basically looking at magnets at very, very low temperatures, arrays of different magnets. So by very low temperatures, I mean we were using liquid helium and liquid nitrogen to cool our materials down to about one Kelvin which is, just for reference, room temperature is about 300 Kelvin. Uh, ice freezes that I believe around a 270 Kelvin. So you go to another 270 Kelvin below that, that's where absolute zero is, right? So we were studying the effects of those very low temperatures on a magnet and what was happening there. So the, the machine just basically involved being able to cool the materials down to very low temperatures while also being able to apply a very strong magnetic field. So in, in order to be able to apply that magnetic field up to 14 Tesla, that required just making sure everything was correct and then being able to pull out the measurements. Uh, there was one problem one day where I came into the lab and the machine was, it's supposed to sit upright and it was tilted about 10 degrees. And I was like, huh, 
this isn't supposed to happen. This was maybe my second month in the lab. I peeked underneath. There was a big bubble underneath. They <laughs> called the older grad students. They came over. They're like, this, this definitely isn't supposed to happen. What's going on? We contacted the vendor. It turned out this was a known problem for machines that were about 20 years old, where because of an oversight they had in the design that they didn't think this could happen, it resulted in one of the vacuum layers literally exploding inside and just yeah. creating that metal bubble that made it tilt. So we had we had to send that in, get it repaired, get it back. Uh, and yeah, that, that took a while. Avoiding roadblocks like that, roadblocks that aren't of my own making is one of the factors that led to me, that led to me joining a bioinformatics lab. So uh, when you're talking about like joining bioinformatics, I know that AI has been like a huge influence in that field. The, my question is like, how has AI shaped this field and how do you use it in your work? I mean, so one of the big things towards, uh, towards AI, more broadly data science and machine learning becoming so prevalent in this field is really the advent of large data, large scale data techniques, right? So things like electronic medical records because of the Affordable Care Act, hospital systems are keeping records of patients, they're keeping records of, hey, what drugs are they taking? Uh, what labs are they taking? What the results were, demographics information. So these types of resources being made available for research purposes. So you can study, instead of studying a cohort of 10 patients, right, you can study a cohort of tens of thousands of patients. So just that sort of large scale of data is what has been allowing the application of these of these machine learning tools to the medical space right? and that's just one example other examples of large-scale data include a newer sequencing technologies making it more efficient more cheaper for allowing research groups to sequence large numbers of samples from a large number of patients instead of bankrupting the lab sequencing only four or five patients Right. So really, it's just this wide scale availability of data that's driving this, in my opinion. And in terms of what the models are doing, what this allows us to do is we can train these models on a broad population so we can see what the trends are across a large subset of patients instead of what I believe happened in the past, which was you were looking at just such small numbers of samples, samples, small numbers of patients that you really couldn't make these kinds of statistical analyses and sort of reach the level of statistical rigor you want to be able to make definitive conclusions. I'm wondering, using these kind of same techniques, have your team looked at responding to the COVID crisis? In the past, right, I think we've mentioned this already, we've used drug repurposing techniques to develop hypotheses for potential novel therapeutics for a wide range of different diseases. So naturally it made a lot of sense for us to try to do the same with COVID-19. So what we have done is right, try to exploit, try to apply our existing expertise to the area. And I, a, a very large number of other researchers have been doing this as well, which I think that just as a side note has been really fascinating to watch just this very rapid response to developing pandemic, right? From an anthropological perspective, I guess, it's just been very interesting to see that and just the response of the community and how research has just been ramping up faster and faster. But going back to what our lab has done is, so we've taken the transcriptomic data that was generated from other groups, either they generated it from comparing patients and controls who didn't have COVID, or they tried infecting cell lines with COVID. So we took those transcriptomic data and we used the same pipeline and we identified some hits that we're definitely very interested in validating. We have some initial validation experiments happening thus far that have been showing some initial levels of promise. So we're, we're really hopeful that our results could represent a real step forward in terms of finding novel therapeutics for the management of COVID-19, right? Because I think as you're aware, there's only a limited number of drugs that have been shown to, fin shown to work well so far. For example, remdesivir, uh, I know dexamethasone and a number of other steroids have been getting some very good press lately. I, there, was, there was a new article today, I believe, that was studying the management of patients across a large number of hospitals in Europe that was looking at the effects, the beneficial effects of these lesser used steroids, showing uh, good results in terms of decreasing the mortality rate. 
So really what we're trying to do is help accelerate the search for these therapeutics that could, that could further lower the mortality rate of COVID. What ways do you think we can accelerate this process? Uh, well, through testing, but is it okay to test a certain vaccine or a certain, a certain cure that, that is not approved yet? How does it play out? There, there definitely needs to be, in my opinion, a controlled process. And you, this, this is what clinical trials are for, right? To establish both the efficacy and the safety of potential interventions, whether those are vaccines for the prevention of COVID-19, whether they're therapeutics for the management of COVID-19, right? You don't want to make the problem worse by prescribing drugs that could end up being more harmful especially in these vulnerable populations where COVID-19 is doing the most damage. So when you're talking about your work, uh, I was wondering what sorts of like skills or like knowledge or prerequisites are kind of required for becoming a competent bioinformaticist and conducting independent research? Yeah, I mean, so backgrounds in programming, statistics, biology, I think those are all definitely huge pluses for bioinformatics. Uh, one interesting thing, at least anecdotally, from the lab I'm a part of, right? So I came in with a good amount of programming experience, some statistics experience, and very little biology, whereas I've worked closely alongside students who have large amounts of biology experience, but had only very, very superficial exposures to coding beforehand. And just one of the big things is being able to work with people of different backgrounds to extract your relevant expertises, share your skill sets together, and be able to blend them together in order to tackle these projects, right? So coding, statistics, which plays a large part into how machine learning works, understanding the biological underpinnings and implications behind it, definitely all very important parts, definitely would help to know all of these. I'm not based purely on my own experience. I wouldn't necessarily say they are all necessarily prerequisites, but what is definitely important is just having the drive to be able to, having the drive to be able to learn about these fields that you've been less exposed to before that you're less comfortable with, right? So if you don't know how to program, just learning how to code, learning how to ask the questions about how how this line of code or how that line of code would work or play out in terms of biology being able to figure out okay what is happening here so i've i found some drug that looks interesting from my pipeline what does that mean how could that drug possibly be working what types of pathways or what types of biology could we hypothesize that these drugs are using in order to manage the disease right so just the big part is the ability to questions. Just as a follow-up to that, what sort of advice would you give students who are pursuing a degree in either like applied math, physics, bioinformatics, or computational biology? My big piece of advice would definitely be to get involved with the research as soon as you possibly can. And I know that that's when I was an undergrad about a decade ago, that was something that was being stressed then too, and I'm sure it's being stressed even more now. But just getting involved in research, seeing how real world research is being conducted, and just becoming part of that process yourself so you can start learning the tools, you can start developing the skills towards gearing towards that if that's a path that interests you. Right? So just being able to start sooner rather than later. Uh, just this past summer, actually, I was inter there, I was mentoring a high school intern in the group, and she was doing a phenomenal amount of work. I can't believe she's a high schooler. She she could afford me into thinking she was a grad student, but right, uh, it's definitely never too early to get involved with research. I know that you have been a researcher at both UCLA and UIUC, and you collaborated on multiple projects with interdisciplinary groups. I'm wondering how has that experience been unique. I'm not really sure I would say that experience is unique to me in the sense that it's a very regular part of academia, it feels like, for these types of multidisciplinary groups to come together, which I think is one of the really great parts about academia, is you're all working together to basically broaden human knowledge, right, to pursue the truth. It's a, it's a very romantic way of putting it, but that's really sort of how I feel about academia personally, which, and I think it's a very resource for just to be able to do research, right?
um, just looking ahead to the future, what do you, uh, what do you think it's going to look like and what are you most excited in your field about for about the next 10 to 20 years in terms of innovation? Yes, in terms of innovation, one of the things I'm looking forward to is because the, the application of machine learning techniques to the, to the medical field still feels like it's really early to me in the sense that companies like Google, for example, they've been using machine learning models for decades to be able to detect fraud or build better algorithms, better find out how they can get you to click the link. Whereas it's definitely been a more recent development in the medical field to apply that. And a lot of that has to go back to just the recent availability of data. So as this data continues to build up and up, and not only as the data itself continues to build up, as researchers begin to develop to databases that are designed to use research on, right? So specifically building these resources that are meant to be used for research as opposed to some of the existing resources, which are great, they're wonderful, they're big, but they're not designed for research. They're very messy, they're very cluttered, you need to do a lot of data cleaning just to be able to get it into a workable format. That's also a large part of bioinformatics is the data cleaning. Definitely the less glamorous part, but a very important part nonetheless. So I'm definitely just looking forward to seeing the innovation as it comes to develop the development of new databases. Uh, I mean, one thing I can see very clearly in my mind is just as these electronic medical record systems are further built up, there's a large push towards, for example, UC-wide electronic medical record system. You think that's something that would already exist, right? One system that collects the data from the UCLA hospital, the UC Riverside hospitals, the UCSF hospitals, but actually they weren't all that compatible. They were stored separately. So just the idea that you could have a more unified database, making sure they're all stored in the same data format instead of different disparate data formats. So just a combination, the development of databases that include things like larger databases or standardizing the databases, I think I'm really excited for because that will make the act of researching them, looking into them, asking questions of them much more easier is the right word for it, but much more tractable. All these data belongs to people like just normal people, patients. And maybe there's a privacy issue and maybe that's why some hospitals, some clinics, they just have the data written down on paper so it's not really entered up into a database. Do you think uh, that's an obstacle to the research? Privacy is definitely an extremely important part of working with this type of sensitive data, right? Like I know I myself wouldn't want my medical records to be able to be leaked. So just making sure you have the appropriate protections in place, the appropriate security in place, de-identifying the electronic medical records is something that I know UCSF research groups have done so that you're not able to go from just the EMR data and use that to identify a real life person, right? So definitely working with privacy is very important. I'm not really sure I would call it an obstacle more than it is a necessity. It's just something you have to work with, you have to live with, and because it's just, it's definitely very important in order to be able to pre preserve the privacy, especially for those patients who don't want their private data exposed. How is creativity involved inside the lab? And while you're doing research, uh, when does creativity come up? I mean, definitely being creative ties into the ability of being able to ask questions, right? Being able to think outside the box, thinking about how if you're, you're stuck on one problem, what I like to do is I like to switch gears and work on a different problem and hope that working on, while working on that problem, something comes to me, either just my brain working in the background or maybe some solution I found while working on this second project will be applicable to the first project, right? So just sort of being able to think outside the box, being able to think, okay, instead of the data I have to work with, are there outside data I could bring in and where could I find these data? Sometimes you'll find them in the unlikeliest of places. So just being able to make sure you're open to the possibilities, I guess. But yeah, so I think 
creativity is definitely pretty important. It lets you think beyond what you were taught, right? So I guess this kind of goes back to my physics background as well, which is where we were taught to step back, take a look at the bigger picture. How could we solve this problem and not necessarily, all right, I have this one tool in my toolbox. Let's just use this for everything. When I think about uh, when I think about STEM related fields, I was scared there might not be any creativity needed, and I would just find whatever I'm doing just a little bit boring or unexciting, or just because I'm, I'm really I really really like working on things that uh, where I have flexibility and I can choose to do it in a certain way. I fear if I go to a lab and I would just be collecting the data and just, there's only one way of doing it. So I always would like to know about how this, this flexibility and creativity and just the, op the option to do it something your way is inside the labs. Of course, and uh, definitely what, what one of the most important parts of research, right, is being able to communicate your results. And that's where creativity can have a huge role in it, whether that's from figuring out how to structure your presentations or to the much more visceral visual designs of graphs and the figures. I've seen some gorgeous figures, even just over the past few months from new journal, journal articles coming out. Uh, and they're even normally, there are competitions for submitting figures from your papers and how beautiful they can be. I, I've also explored some statistical graphs, plotting out how the COVID situation has been across the United States and there's just multiple version of representing the data and yeah. visually to for us to see what's happening. Yeah, there have been so many different dashboards people have developed from publicly available data to be able to track either COVID nationally or even on a local level tracking related factors. It's definitely been really interesting.